want a luxury sports car from the 2000s. With a budget of £40,000, what do you go for? Well, this week, I pitch a front-engined V12 rear-wheel drive from Britain against a V8 mid-engined four-wheel drive from Germany. Aston Martin DB9 Volante against Audi R8 V8. I can't wait. Welcome to this week's Fast and Fun. So first of all, let's look at some of the numbers. In the Aston Martin DB9, what we have under there is a 5.9 litre V12 producing 450 brake horsepower and about 420 pounds feet of torque. And that outpunches the R8 with its 4.2 litre V8 producing 414 brake horsepower but only 317 pounds foot of torque. Aston have put theirs in the front. Audi decided to put the R8s mid-mounted to get better weight distribution. Gearbox wise, the DB9 with its GT Grand Tourer credentials is in this guise and in most geysers came as a full automatic slush box. In the R8 they came as either an R-tronic or later S-tronic but the more favourable one was the manual transmission, the six speed open gated manual shifter. DB9 though managed to squeeze in a couple of extra seats it became a 2 plus 2, the R8 stuck with just being a two-seater. And because this is the Volante, it is the convertible. You've got open top driving, putting all that power just through the rear wheels. Audi stayed loyal to the four-wheel drive Quattro system. And although rear wheel drive bias, it is still a four-wheel drive car. Let's look at some of the numbers, stats. 0-60, to 60, these cars, is similar. The RA edges it slightly at around 4.5, 4.5, 4.6 seconds. DB9, the Volante, is a couple of tenths back from that. The 0-100 to 100 times are very similar, though. They're very comparable, about 12.5 seconds for the quarter mile for both these cars, which, back in the 2000s, was for high-performance cars even though we've got hot hatches now achieving those similar numbers. And then values and price. So these are both price, good low mileage R8 V8 manuals and DB9 Volantes. These are both, this has got 30,000 on, the R8's got about 37,000 on. These are both low mileage examples. Get a good one of these, you're probably looking at best part of 40,000 to get you into one of these cars. But when new, the DB9 Volante back in, this is a 2006, would have set you back 120,000. So they're hovering around a third of what they were new. The R8 manuals, these were just under 80,000, about 76, 77,000 in 2008. These now, a good one, is going to set you back about 40,000. So still over half what it was new. But buy well, and you just think that neither of these is going to lose much money. They are both and have become modern classics. But you don't buy either of these cars based on numbers, based on facts. You don't buy them with your head, you buy them with your heart. Because you want an Aston Martin, because you want a mid-engine V8 supercar. These are bought for the passion, the thrill of driving, the, 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 the way they look the way they sound, the way they drive, where you want to go and get the keys and go for a drive for nothing other than driving pleasure. Whether it's the Aston Martin with the badge, with the air vents on the bonnet, with the alloy wheels, the multi-spoke alloy wheels, the big caliper and discs, the twin exhaust, or the R8 with the glass screen for the engine, the side blades, the low, wide profile. These are both intoxicating cars. But yet, when I've reviewed both these independently, I've, for me, they are two of the best looking cars on the road. The DB9 is pure elegance. That long, elongated bonnet, shoving and cramming that V12 into the front. 
Inside, it's premium. You're buying an Aston Martin. The Audi, it's low, it's wide, it's squat, and looks, more, looks much smaller, and it is. This R8 V8 comes in at a shade over 1,600 kilograms in weight. The DB9 is pushing 1,900 kilograms. So there's over 250 kilograms difference in weight. Now, top speed is ill-affected by that. They're both, as near as damn it, push 190 miles an hour. But that weight, how does that feel compared to the lighter, potentially more agile R8? Well, today we're going to find out, because I'm going to drive these cars back to back on some of my favourite roads. So which one am I taking out first? Well, and I'm trying to do this with complete impartiality, even though the R8 is mine. But I think it's only fair I'll take the Aston Martin DB9 Volante out first and then I'll follow it up straight away with the R8. And we're lucky enough in early spring here in the UK, we've got a dry day, so conditions should be the same for both cars. The sun is half out and let's see which of these two cars drives the best. as I clamber into the Aston Martin. So, traditional key fob. You turn the key for the lights to come on. And there is stark contrast, really, um, on the inside. The Aston Martin definitely feels a step above the quality of the R than the R8. The nice small leather clad steering wheel that just it feels new this infontaine system the center console it all is it oozes quality there's a there's a a nice functional feel to all these particular switches so let me just turn the temperatures down when i start it it starts on the button so foot on the brake and that rasp of the V12 when it starts sounds fantastic. Okay, so let's go off, get on some better roads, and you'll join me in a few minutes. So the Aston Martin gets off to a really good start, actually. First of all, the badge. Now, I know Audi, similar to BMW, similar to Mercedes, they're a premium German brand, but they're not Aston Martin. Aston Martin's got that heritage. It's got the hand-built, in England credentials that Audi just can't match. And if it was car keys on the table in the pub, it's the Aston Martin badge rather than the Audi that wins the initial applause and especially one that carries the DB initials. Second up, that's a win, I think, for Aston Martin as well, is practicality. You see, the Aston's got a proper boot compared to the R8's trunk, and it's a decent, it's wide, it's quite relatively deep, and it's enough for a handful of bags. Whereas the frunk on the R8, well, it's mediocre at best. And to tell you the truth, if you're going away for anything longer than the weekend, you're probably going to struggle. The ace up the sleeve for the DB9 is the rear seats. Now, you could argue in behind the R8, there's a little bench to enough for a small little sort of handheld luggage. But here, in the DB9, there's certainly more space. So practicality, the DB9 wins, although the plus two, the two rear seats are, I have to say, borderline unusable. I'm in my driving position, not particularly far back, and the seat behind me, I can just put my fingers between the back of my seat and the start of the rear seat. So in other words, there is no legroom. So for me, they're almost unusable but it's good 
alternative space. So DB9 wins on practicality as well. Half acceleration. Oh, and it's, it's, it's effortless, that V12. And I suppose sound. <laughs> now this is gonna be a difficult one. How can a V V8 against a V12? The V12's got to sound. It's one of the best engines ever built, the V12. But in the DB9, this is standard. This is OEM spec. This is how it left the factory back in 2006. And for me, it's too dialed back. It's too muted. Can I really tell it's a V12? Well, there's a bar when you get higher up the revs. But by that stage, you're starting to put on some serious speed and for 95% of the time there's just not that aura about it I just can't see that that rumble that that noise that I want now it's probably easily fixed because you could put an aftermarket exhaust and you could get that bark of that V12 but as it stays today and as it stands today I just know the RA and this is the controversial part because the RA the only change in that RA is it's got a Capristo exhaust on it, aftermarket exhaust, which, and I know the standard R8 V8 can be quite muted as well. But it doesn't give me that sense, that there's no tingling, that sound is so, so important on any sports car. And that's one of the reasons, the big reasons I think EVs, for as good as they may get, I just worry that, for me, sound is one of if not the most important part of any sports car. It's not about how fast you go anymore. It's about that sound, it's about the senses, it's about the tingles that you get, and sound is critical to that. So unfortunately, DB9, you're not winning the sound competition against an R8 with a Capristo exhaust. <laughs> Cost of ownership? Well, I don't think there's going to be much between either of these cars. To get a good one, you again, the Volantes, 35, 40,000. You can get them cheaper. In fact, coupes are cheaper than Volantes. Um, but I personally wouldn't drop into sort of 25. I wouldn't drop to the bottom of the market of these because you could just be dropping into a whole world of pain. And clearly being asked in there's going to be some serious costs associated with running one of these cars. But probably no more than the R8. The driving position, it's a nice place to be, the Aston Martin. It feels quality. There's a few rattles and squeaks. You would expect that as well, being a convertible. And the side bolster on the outer side of my right leg it's just digging a little bit it's not quite as I don't know just doesn't fit my torso as well as the R8 does but the instrument binnacle it's clear it, that chiseled look like it's been chiseled out of granite or metal or something and it and it looks great even though it's as good as useless with that analog speedo that that barely moves from six to seven o'clock position with a ridiculous 220 mile an hour speedo that reaches round to the one o'clock it just means that the analog speedo is just well almost pointless just see how what it's like down this really bumpy um difficult road and this is where i took the, um, the DB9 on a review I did a couple of months ago and it's more it's more sports car feeling than GT I, I have to say um, it's a little bit edgy at times and that's not a bad thing but I was expecting it more to be a cruiser but actually the steering is quite quite alert quite alive I'll just take this left here V12, open that V12 up. It's
it's got a lot of low down torque that v12 and then it just builds up to that crescendo i just wish it'd be a little bit louder the automatic gearbox i do miss a manual and i just think that's where they are it's going to score so well i just miss that that engagement really of having a manual The one thing I really struggle with with the DB9 though is hustling it down that B road. It just, the gearbox just not smart enough. It's just not, does, doesn't do the gear changes just that quick enough, whether, whether using the flappy paddles or in full auto. And I just not, I just can't commit like I can in other cars. And that's a shame. Oh, there's a, there's a deer just crossing the road here, so we'll just slow down for that. Shame I can't get that on video. One of the delights of living in a forest. It feels much more comfortable when you're just driving at six or seven tenths. When you're just using that torque, building the revs whenever you need to, and just coasting and using a lot of that torque as soon as you push on, it just loses some of that composure for me. It just feels a little bit, a little bit too edgy, not, not sharp enough. The brakes, are, these are a little bit grabby, really difficult to adjust. And that turning, the weight transfer, I can feel that added weight of the DB9. What I'm doing now is I'm heading back from the loop, heading back home to jump in the R8, and then we'll see how that drives. We clamber into the R8, so jumping inside the R8, it is most definitely a step down in quality. A hundred percent. The centre console, in particular, where it was all nicely finished in the Astin, this has got more cheaper um, Germanic plastics. Really, it's not poor quality. Um, it's a nice place to be, but it's not premium like the Aston was. Even things, even things like the steering wheel. It's a nice, okay, flat bottom steering wheel, but the Aston was a better steering wheel. Um, although it's got a proper speedo and rev counter that you can actually see. But the piece de resistance for the R8, for the V8, is this, the manual six-speed open gate shifter. It looks great, and it, I know it even drives even better. Right, start it with a very chunky, ugly-looking Audi key. Clutching, I think. I can't even remember my own car. And we start. It's gone into a cold start first of all, um, really vocal, um, and I'll make sure that the valves are open for this upturn that off. We don't want the radio on, we never need the radio on, I never drive with the radio on in the R8 because I always have the valves open, it just makes it such a thrilling driver's car. Right, as in the Astin, let's take it out, let's get it warmed up first, get some oil temp on the car and then I'll give you my review of the R8. The noise is the standout feature, first of all. Um, that V8, the Capristo exhaust, I, I don't know if it picks it up on the mic well enough, but it is night and day. and. If I was after a DB9, I would certainly look at some form of aftermarket exhaust to bring out that V12 bark, because to, 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 to put the R8 ahead of the um, DB9 is a little bit unfair, because as I say, because it's got the Capristo exhaust fitted. But they are night and day. This, this sends shivers down your spine, tingles, goose pimps on your, or goose bumps on your arm, because the the sound that it makes. I also find the seats 
much, much um, more comfortable than the Astins. There's no digging in, they're a little bit more softer, a little bit more squidgier. If anything, I'd have thought they'd be the other way around. The R8 being a bit more, a bit more, uh, a little more lumber sport, a bit more hardcore than the more GT oriented, GT oriented uh, DB9, but it's not the case. So just give it a little squirt up this hill through after this junction here. So second gear. And it's, the gearbox is an absolute joy. And it's a really big consideration to make. If you're buying a car as an everyday practical car, I get automatics. But if you're buying it for the weekend and the evenings as a bit of a toy, a summer car, then for me, you just can't be a manual. And this R8 gearbox is apps, is sweet as they come. It really is. The gear changes. Well, you find you're changing gear for absolutely no reason. The other note is throttle response. The RH throttle sensitivity and response is so much more sharper than the more sort of lazier um, DB9s. Not that the DB9 was specifically bad, but it's when you jump in into an RA having been in the DB9, the, the, the night and day again, you can adjust just the slightest flex of your heel and you can just control that, that, that those revs and they just go flying up in the RA so quickly. So this is one of my favourite B roads here and it's it's a bumpy left and right, it's got a few straights in it, it's a real mixed bag and um, the R8 is just the way it can ride really poorly, poorly laid roads, potholed roads off camber is astonishing. And just again third gear just trying to stretch them revs it's absolutely sounds phenomenal oh. the turning it's it feels light on its feet it feels direct there's no whiff of understeer at all it feels composed you can almost adjust the car, the car through the turn, through the corner with the with the throttle. It's so sensitive. It's just whereas the DB9, it all gets a little bit, feels a little bit rushed. It feels a little bit heavy. Turning's not quite as sharp. You can feel all the weight transferring. Here, it, you can feel it's mid-mounted. You can feel it's 250 kilos lighter. It just makes it a better car on that B road. What a afternoon of driving these two wonderful cars. So what is my, why summary? What's my thoughts on this shootout between the DB9 Volante and the R8 V8? In isolation, these are both great cars. The DB9 has got things going for it. It looks stunning. The quality within the car. The V12, add an exhaust on, and it's just such a wonderful, wonderful engine. And if you want to cruise along at six, seven tenths with the auto box, it's a really nice place to do it. But ultimately, if you want a driver's car, a driver-focused car, 
then there can be only one winner. And it's the R8 V8 by some margin. <coughs> the ace up the sleeve for the R8 really is its GT credentials. Because I was expecting to say that going down a B road, I'd pick the R8, but going on a European road trip across France into the Alps, I'd pick the DB9. But I wouldn't. I'd still pick the R8. And it's not how quick you get there for me, but it's how you get there. The R8 wins. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, as always, please, thumbs up, subscribe, stay tuned. Another video next week. Thanks for watching, guys.